In the 1980s, Sir David Jason had gone from Granville to Del Boy and had become a superstar. Didn't you know Harry had died? Creating some unforgettable comic moments. Of course we knew Harry had died. That's why we came dressed as Batman and Thingy. The performer's newly found stardom was rooted in his gift for comedy, crafted through years of hard graft on radio, stage and screen. We're off, eh? Lovely jubbly. But the working-class lad from Finchley still craved the respect afforded to other so-called serious actors. That opportunity came in 1987, when he starred in the Channel 4 adaptation of the classic Tom Sharp novel, Porterhouse Blue. What would this do for the starving of the third world? Not a lot. Roast swan stuffed with widgeons are very... Quiet taste, my lady. Hic ego adatum postulo. Set on the grounds of Cambridge University, the drama was packed with acting heavyweights. Sir David was cast against type as the college head porter Scullion. Totally absurd. This is our ceremony, my lady. We kept Henry VIII waiting for ten minutes. David actually volunteered to audition for Scullion in Porterhouse Blue. He was so keen to prove that he could do more than comedy, that he could be a very, very well-respected, dramatic actor. It was very important, sir. Career at stake. Now, any actor who's worked in comedy will tell you you have to be a superb actor, generally speaking, to be able to handle comedy and timing. And, and I think it was really to convince everyone that he could handle a big, big role like that. Just taking the master his train. Well, what about the ambulance, Mr. Scullion? Never heard about it. No more than you did. You know what we say in Porterhouse? Master dies in his own bed, or not at all. Sir David delivered a powerhouse performance, sprinkled with comic gems, including a memorable scene seeing him pop 500 inflated condoms. <laughs> <laughs> He went round with a broom, stabbing them to, to break them, but of course there was a little pin in the front of the broom to help him pop them. In 1988, his performance would earn Sir David Jason a BAFTA for Best Actor and the respect of his peers. He's really fiercely proud of the role he played and he wanted to prove a point, I suppose, that he could take on these serious roles and then to have it so brilliantly received, the BAFTA and the accolades and to stand on that stage. Porterhouse Blue proved he was a star blessed with real versatility, but an even bigger departure away from sitcom comedy lay ahead. Whilst filming The Darling Buds of May, the show's producers asked him what he wanted to do next. The actor had long admired shows like Morse, Taggart and Columbo and fancied having a crack at fighting crime as a TV cop. He talked about the possibility of this detective series I didn't know what it was going to be. I think I kind of assumed, as maybe a lot of people did, that it would be comedy drama. Thank you, Mark. He was extremely keen to investigate something, some aspect of his own acting, which was very, very different, which wasn't a, a, a charming, cuddly, wide boy. Detective Inspector Frost. Yeah, I know. What do you want? I want to come in. Sir David Jason fitted the bill perfectly. I also want to know what give it back means. Cutting a dramatically different figure to what viewers had become accustomed. A serious dramatic role that showed that David Jason, yes, he could be Del Boy, but he was a really great character actor. I want to know who he is. What? This was a man with a tragedy in his past. And that came, he played that beautifully and utterly truthfully. You live and you die. And the difference doesn't affect a single person in the whole world. You probably won't like me for saying so. Um, but, you know, David is not... He's not garrulous. He's not, he's, not a, he's not a host. He's not a public entertainer. He's not a show-off. Um, he is thoughtful and quiet and sometimes taciturn. He can be grumpy. And he's good-hearted and he is honest. And I think those are the qualities that that you see in Frost. You see a combination of, of, of grumpiness and, and um, truth-seeking. 
Yes, I think I ought to have a word with those two. Frost, in a way, is, is the character that's, that I've seen of his work that's most similar to him. The first episode was aired in 1992. The two are epic, costing an estimated £3 million, a huge sum at the time. But the film titled Care and Protection was another smash hit for the actor, pulling in 18 million viewers. What's Mullet doing here this time of day? There was a briefing on the missing kid. Mm. You were phoned about it last night. This is cold. Frost also gave Sir David a chance to share screen time with his brother, Arthur. This is uh, DS Reed's military record. Though he was by now a huge star, the eldest sibling had crafted a fine TV career, seeing the brothers appear together in the hit crime series as well as the darling Buds of May. That either in this court or in that hotel, that lady is telling a lie. You're right, she, and a hundred big and two if you ask me. Arthur never really resented David's success at all. Arthur was pleased for David. David was pleased how much his mother would have loved to have seen the two of them together in a top, top show. This is personal. Personal? Yeah. How oh, right. Sir David was working harder than ever, bouncing between leading roles in A Touch of Frost and The Darling Buds of May, two massive hits. But private grief struck the star during the production of A Touch of Frost when his partner of 18 years, Mifanwe Talog, died from cancer in 1995. Mifanwe's death was a devastating blow, but years later, he found love again with Jill Hinchcliffe, who he met at Yorkshire TV. But the couple shocked the nation when the actor became a first-time dad to Sophie May at the age of 61. I think it was unfair that David was uh, criticised for, for being a late father. In other words, the implication was that he'd been utterly selfish in uh, uh, putting his uh, acting career first. I think we were all aware that they had enough press intrusion without all of us going, anyway, what's it like and how old is it and all those things. But I think it opened another side of his life which has been really, really good. The pensioner dad was still maintaining his powerhouse status, and he went on to defy expectations by reviving a much-loved and iconic comic role. It's just that there is a rumour that they, um, excuse me, they're in the area. Oh. <laughs> is that funny noise? Oh, well, sure, sure. Right? Sir David's career has seen him rocket his way up the comedy ladder to become the gold standard on British TV. This working class lad um, became such a massive star on television, made such a good living from it, and made some of the greatest TV comedy that we'll probably ever see. <laughs> but the star readily admits his career would not have been the same if it wasn't for the guidance and friendship of another comedy great. He used to talk about Ronnie Barker all the time. And uh, a bit like David has now become to, I suspect, a nation of younger actors, was how I think uh, David felt about Ronnie Barker. And he had great love for him, great respect. And the first thing I have to say is, Granville, you, you, you've done it. <laughs> so it was fitting when in 2003, he received the prestigious BAFTA Fellowship from the great man himself. But just two years after this moving moment, Sir David would lose his mentor and friend at the age of 76. They'd become very, very firm friends through their working relationships. And um, Ronnie Barker had been so generous as to to hand over the title of the governor, which David had bestowed upon him, Ronnie handed it back to David after Ronnie had retired. The governor! The governor! The duo last shared screen time in Open All Hours in 1985. <laughs> Have you got that tea on yet before you so sit down there? Nearly 30 years later, 
Sir David's thoughts return to this classic sitcom. I often wondered whatever happened to Granville. You know, when, when Arkwright, bless him, has now gone to the big grocery shop in the sky, and we thought, we thought well, yeah, maybe he took over the shop. So I got in touch with Roy Clark, who originally wrote it, and he said, oh, I love the idea. So in 2013, the classic sitcom with the iconic theme tune returned as still open all hours. The relaunched comedy seeing a now elderly Granville take charge of the Doncaster-based convenience store. Good morning, Vera. Some of these were here yesterday. Well, so was I, and I'm still sweet and juicy. The Granville was now old enough to be a granddad, you know, and uh, there was different blood there. So it wasn't a remake of something that set in the 70s. It was now. I saw that. You always were keen-eyed, Mrs Agnew. Sally Lindsay was among a host of comedy stalwarts invited to star alongside Sir David in the pilot episode. How's your romantic life? I heard that it had lost a bit of its sparkle. Where did you hear that? From your husband, actually. <laughs> but I just remember being massively nervous, really, and, uh, and thinking, it's David Jason, it's David Jason. It's David, I'm just talking to David Jason. <laughs> oh. Don't tell him that, though, he'll love that. And on set, he had clearly lost none of his comic touch, crafting some classic TV moments. How are you today, Kat? When he jumped up behind the counter with his blooming wig on, I just lost it. And I never lose it on screen, honestly. I, I'm really... I never... hardly ever, and I just lost it. It just made me laugh that much. He just looked so ridiculous. But throughout filming, Sir David never forgot the man most associated with the show, ensuring his mentor had a permanent place on set. <laughs> you Tete taught me some stuff, didn't you? <laughs> Still watching over him and the spirit of Arkwright, Acker, Ronnie Barker, is still on set. I'll never get into heaven. Probably be closed anyway. <laughs> These big companies don't work the hours that we do, do they? Eh? <laughs> and David used to talk to him even when he wasn't being Granville. It was about, it was a massive respect. He knew that he was the Don. He knew that he'd started all this. That's to do with David's relationship with Ronnie back in the day, which he's brought into the future through the generations. And that's really lovely. And it was lovely to be part of it. Well, let's see what me, 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 me magic there is in an anchovy paste, shall we? <laughs> Throughout his stellar career, Sir David Jason has been given the highest accolades the television industry has to offer. But in 2005, he received the biggest honour of all, a knighthood for services to acting and comedy from Her Majesty the Queen. He was fiercely proud and delighted, I'm sure, to have got that knighthood. The boy from Finchley hasn't done so bad, as he puts it. The boy from Finchley got himself a knighthood and an imprint into the consciousness of Britain and made some of the television that's going to last for, forever. It was a great thing, a, a, a marvellous, marvellous thing. I mean, richly deserved, you know, if, if anybody has um, offered services to show business, he certainly has. We did used to joke. I remember very early on in the rehearsal room, he'd say, well, one day when I'm, when I'm knighted, and we'd all go, oh, and we thought it was the funniest thing. So, I mean, I think probably he was either angling it for, for it for years, or he would have been absolutely over the moon, because we did used to joke, go, oh, yes, Sir David, and have a bit of a laugh about it. So I would have thought, yeah, that would have made his day. I'm one of the Hogfather's little helpers, me. It's official. Sir oh, David Jason is still bringing joy to viewers to this very day breathing new life into the iconic work of the late, great Terry Pratchett. You've actually been drinking the actual drink little children leave for the actual Hogfather. Oh, yeah. Why not? He won't be drinking anymore, will he? Eh? <coughs> not where he's gone. <clears throat> How many have you had, may I ask? Hmm? Well, I don't know. I haven't been counting. I think he's brilliant in it because there is something, um, there's something childlike about him. Sleep tight. I know I shall. 
pardon. And maybe that's another reason why, you know, so many people kind of instantly take him to their bosom. Uh, but there's also a complete lack of talking down. It's got to be Chibbleish, isn't it, eh? A bit like the beard, really. David just goes for who it is, and this happens to be an elf with enormous ears who is in the service of death, who's dressed up as Santa Claus. Oh, and that reminds me. The ho, ho, ho could do with some more work, if you don't mind me saying so. But he's charming, charming in it. So if you think the eight-year-old is considering calling time on his career anytime soon, then think again. Well, I'm very busy at the moment voicing cartoons for the uh, foreseeable future. Otherwise, I am available. <laughs> <laughs> if Hollywood is watching this show, I am available. Nice and cool, you know what I mean? <laughs> David Jason isn't the kind of person who looks back. I get better looking every day. <sighs> Can't wait for tomorrow. He doesn't stop. In the list of television comedy greats, David's right up there. <laughs> you could put David in a programme today and it will sell out. The audiences will love it. He's still got that. <laughs> you told me some stuff, didn't you? David is somebody of enormous skill and versatility who had the uncanny ability to make the audience love him. Did you say that, anyway? A career like that is just unbelievable. So I think he will be up there, this, the jewel in the crown of this industry, definitely. Everyone's a winner, Petit Dejeuner, right? <laughs>